Yes, everybody, and welcome back to Tar Heel Illustrated dot com or of course if you are watching on our fast growing youtube channel you guys know what that is that's tar hill illustrated i'm thi staff writer jacob turner and joining me as he always does it's our very own publisher andrew jones and aj we're here for a, 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 a interesting and in some ways fun little thi podcast is we're going to be <laughs> looking back over the last few days for the tar heels and how it's kind of all unraveled and gone down really starting on Sunday, we're recording this one on Tuesday evening. And AJ, uh, yeah, we'll fun, go- fun for who, Jacob? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I guess fun for us to look back a little bit because there is a lot of it's different. Yeah, it's different. It's unprecedented in a lot of ways, at least you know, in terms of what we're where Carolina is right now for where they were started the season in a lot of ways. So it, I guess maybe unique in a lot of ways, because I don't think we expected yeah. we'd be doing a podcast like this on March 14th, but that's the reality we find ourselves in right now. Um, so we'll start, we'll go back to Sunday because, you know, selection Sunday, Carolina, obviously not getting in the tournament. Um, and then a, a little bit later, pretty soon after that, um, Carolina, a statement came out from Hubert Davis in the program that declining to play in the NIT. Um, let's stay on Sunday for a little bit before we move forward to Monday and what went down on that day more specifically, but obviously no surprise Carolina didn't get in the tournament, didn't deserve to at the end of the day, just the resume and the, what they did this year just didn't warn it. And I think most people, if you can look at it with a level head would agree with that and, and declining the NIT has been a little bit more of a, a hot topic for a lack of a better word. Why I think some people's opinions differ from others, especially Carolina fans. So Take me back to to Sunday, AJ, because again, uh, I don't think we expected we'd be kind of ha- Carolina would be having this kind of selection Sunday, uh, maybe f- four months ago. No, but over the last month we did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I, and I told you two weeks ago they wouldn't play in the NIT either. Mm-hmm. You were you so, hit the nail um, on the head with that. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. And, and and then it was, it absolutely was hammered home with about a thousand exclamation marks when I walked in and out of that locker room the other night, mm-hmm. and that season was over. It was and so it's okay. Heavy. And I've gotten a lot of pushback from people. It's been really interesting what people are saying about them not accepting the NIT bid and what they think it means. Some people are just, you know, oh, they're quitters and stuff. They they're not they're not trying to look behind the curtain to really see what what the deal is there. Some people are a little bit more open-minded about it and aren't as abrasive with their criticism of that. And and I get why people don't care a lot for my stance on it and generally speaking i would it's very rare where i would actually defend a team for not playing in the nit but the circumstances around this program as we've seen the last couple of days Mm. are very unique and different Uh, think about the activity on monday with two guys hitting the portal and the conversations that hubert is having with his players and they've had quite a few so far and there are a few more that that are still going to happen Uh, spring break some guys are away and they're thinking about things they're finalizing whatever decisions that they're going to make and we're going to hit on the rj and armada another podcast and and things like that so i think it's just best for everyone involved that they got into that part that phase of the postseason now because hubert may have to go in and bring in multiple guys from the portal multiple maybe three maybe four depending on how things shape out and right now he gets to look at the portal starting tuesday kids are allowed to visit in person campuses coaches are allowed to go see kids in person so why not get a head start you know Mm -hmm. last year they brought they they didn't even spend any time on that really until they got back from new orleans and you're already well into april at that point a lot of other guys that already found their schools so they end up bringing in Pete in mid to late June. I think it was the day of the showtime in football. Mm-hmm. So that was what, June 18th? Of course. And then he shows up. Mm-hmm. And I think it's safe to say it didn't maybe work out as he planned and as they planned. The year before, Hubert gets hired in April. He's got to get acclimated. He went and got Manic and McCoy right away. McCoy is what McCoy is. Manic worked out great. Um, sort of a self-starting kind of guy and plays a role that didn't need to mesh a ton. Mm-hmm. He's kind of a guy that would fit in a lot of situations. And then you bring Dawson Garcia in very late in that process, I guess in July, and it didn't work out. There wasn't a lot of time. So you want to go get guys now, especially if there's so there may be a lot of turnover, get as many guys in in May as you can. McCoy and Manic came in in May. 
-hmm. and they started assimilating right away. They started getting to know the guys right away. And that's what you need. So the extra time that they gain right now, instead of preparing for Moorhead State Mm -hmm. and NIT game, they're doing this stuff. And that's why I think ultimately it's the most important thing. I I don't look at it as that North Carolina is too big for the NIT. I don't look at that at all. Because in 2010, they played in the NIT, and they got a tremendous amount of value from it. It was a totally different set of circumstances than this team. And then 2003, they played in the NIT, and even though Doherty was fired, those kids got a lot out of those three games. And and I think it helped them the following year when Roy took over. So this is a different deal. I could sit here and list a thousand reasons why I think it's the right move. And, And I won't tell anybody who says it isn't the right move. I won't tell you you're wrong, because you're right. Mm-hmm. It is. I just think that there's an, an, an additional factor here, which is the circumstance of the program that Hubert needs to get straightened out. There's a lot that needs fixing with Hubert, with the roster, with the guys that are going to come back. I think there's a lot of mending that needs to be done because the, as I've started to dig into the postscript stats and some stuff I started running Tuesday afternoon on our site, things went bad late. The offensive numbers were awful the last month for the most part. And we're going to do some pods where we discuss these numbers and we discuss why we're going to include David in some of them. There's a lot that needs to be fixed. So in my opinion, get that crap going now. And it's literally every prong of the program right now. In my opinion, that needs some tweaking, altering and pivoting. Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And we were talking about this a little bit off camera, AJ, just to stay on the NIT for a second. But for me, there was a lot of, I don't know if outrage is the right word, but it probably is because that's social media nowadays. Outrage is fair. About (laughs) about Carolina declining the NIT. And for me, I I think the 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 rage for like the outrage was was not necessarily directed towards it was directed towards Carolina not accepting the NIT, but I don't think that's necessarily where it was created. I think the the outrage was from the fact that at the end of the day, Carolina didn't the preseason number one team became the first team and you know, since the field expanded to not make the NCAA term as a preseason number one team. I think that's essentially where the outrage came from. It's the fact that this Carolina team came into the season with so many expectations. And the fact of the matter is after losing to UVA in the tournament, ACC tournament, I think everybody kind of knew this season was over. You talked about being in the locker room, AJ. I wasn't there, but I watched the videos. And I mean, would you ask five kids if they wanted to play in it and four kids if they wanted to play in it? And they all basically said, I don't know. And, And to me, that's a, or yeah, that's a no. It's a no. Exactly. If you really wanted to play in it, it's of course we want to play. We want to go and compete. So I think for me, I I just think it was a little bit, I don't think Carolina fans are mad that, Oh, Carolina, I can't, I don't get to see Carolina play Murray state in the NIT. Like, Oh, I'm just so mad about that. I think they're mad about the fact that Carolina is in this situation in the first place. And from a fan's perspective, like, like they are, I mean, I think that's something you can completely understand. Right. I mean, it's, it's understandable to be frustrated with how this year went down. You'd, I don't think if I don't think you could call yourself a fan if you weren't frustrated at how this year went down. So I'll take it a step further. And it's fascinating because I appreciate the interaction we have on Twitter during yeah, games. For sure. And yeah. and you know, we have our, our message board, but I like to do the Twitter. I like to be involved on Twitter a lot during the games because we bring in new people into the tent. And it's a lot of them you know, are quite passionate and they express their passion on Twitter. And I I'm not going to say Twitter's just a comedy show and I don't give it any validity. I give it some because people are there and it ma- matters to them. So they're commenting. That's their avenue to release their voice and what they think about things. And we kind of got to a point this season, and I started paying attention to this specifically, where when the Tar Heels played well, you can go to our Twitter account and look at all of our threads during games. When the Tar Heels played well, there was virtually no commentary. When they played poorly, just him. Like they're fire. beating the hell out of Clemson. And then Clemson goes on a 6-0 run, and there's like six people commenting on it. Mm-hmm. Oh, here we go again. Mm-hmm. And then Carolina reel off a 12 nothing run. Crickets. Yeah. So I think what this is the result of, to be honest, just go back and look at the BC game last week, and the next night look at UVA. Yeah, exactly. I think people got so were so unhappy with this team so confused by the performance, so pissed off, so disenfranchised, so disgusted that they just got used to filling their shovels with dirt every time they played. And I think what ended up happening, and we've seen this the last couple of days, people have more dirt. 
and they're just shoveling dirt on the team. They're just burying this team as much as they can because they're so dissatisfied by how the season went. It's almost like, well, if you're going to lose, you might as well lose 100 to nothing instead of 60 to nothing. I think people are trying to make it 100 to nothing by pummeling them one last time because it's all they can do. And I guess Mm – as more, more kids hit the portal, they're going to continue to pummel. Hubert, they're going to blame him solely and not look at any of the other factors. Not that there are a ton of other factors in some of these cases. It's strictly got to go somewhere else. This isn't working. But I just think that people right now, the, the, the ones who are the most vocal, they are conditioned to just shovel dirt. And there's a lot of dirt because there's a lot of negativity because this club checked so many boxes, historic boxes in a lot of ways of negativity. Mm-hmm. And, and without having a burning need to run through them, we could throw a few of them at you right now. This is now the second time since 1966 North Carolina's not in the postseason. Now, granted, three years ago, there was no postseason. That club wouldn't have been in the postseason. They finished 14 and 19. Yeah, 14 and 19, yeah. But there was no postseason. Nobody, Florida State was maybe the best team in the country. Unfortunately, there was no postseason for them either. So it doesn't count. This is what the fifth straight year they've lost double figure number of games Fourth straight year. Fourth straight, and yeah. it's five, five out of the last six. Mm-hmm. It's also, I think eight out of the last 11 or something. Yeah. Something crazy like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is the, this would, this, they've had five NIT appearances since the field opened up to multiple schools. I believe no, it's two NIT appearances since then. Cause I'm trying to think out loud here because 75 was when it opened up to multiple schools and every year since then, when UNC either had 20 wins or a winning conference record or both, they made the NCAA tournament until this year. And then of course, everybody knows the number one ranking uh, futility and yeah. fresh fastest team to fall out of the poll. No, no preseason number one had ever lost four in a row before in the season. They did it twice this year. Mm-hmm. So, there's that's why there's so much dirt. And with each one of these negative things that happen, it's like, you know, when the dump truck, I know it maybe doesn't happen anymore. It used to when I grew up back in the day, uh, they would dump a bunch of dirt in a driveway when you were going to do a bunch of yard work. Yeah. Or something yeah. Like that. Mm-hmm. I remember my dad got that. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to me because <laughs> I got to play with my trucks and army men in that thing. Uh, and uh, but but what I'm saying is it's days. like every time there's negativity, there's a dump truck of dirt in front of everybody. So there's a lot of new stuff to shovel. Mm-hmm. I think that's what people have been doing. And it's kind of a release, which is why I'm not pushing back with a lot of people. I get it. I totally get why they're upset. They're upset that, my gosh, you guys turn this down. It's almost like maybe they wanted to play one more time so they could really bash them when they get eliminated from the NIT. Yeah. Maybe that's what people needed to do. That was their... That would be their swan song as angry fans. I don't know. But mm-hmm. I get the frustration. I get the anger. I totally understand it. But I still think that they made the right decision. And what's long-term matters a lot more than the short-term right now. Because long-term, meaning next season, that's going to determine a lot of things. I think the program enters the season right at a fork in the road. Yeah. And this way, you fall off a cliff. This way, you survive. Mm-hmm. It's going to be interesting to see, man. And it's a huge off season ahead, which is why I agree with you. It's probably better that that Carolina started earlier because the last thing I'll say on it before we move on, even if Carolina goes and wins the NIT, which I don't think they would have done because I think this team was done. Like you said, what does that really do? Preseason number one team wins the NIT. Is that really a a little bit that you want to have? I don't know. It would have been embarrassing. But another thing is a lot of people are saying, well, they just been more, more playing time for the reserves. Who's to say Hubert would play the reserves? I don't think that ever would have happened. I really don't. I don't think he would have. I think it would have been the same old, same old. This is one of my criticisms of Hubert. He spoke a lot about adjustments the last six weeks of the season. And an awful lot here, the week of the NC State game, right? After Mm -hmm. they lost to Miami, I think they went to NC State. And he said that they were going to make offensive adjustments and they never did, which is why my column after the NC State game was, tweaks pivots and alters oh my like where were they Mm -hmm. they weren't there so one of the criticisms to him which is completely justified is that he didn't adjust Mm -hmm. so who's to say that with the two-day turnover into an nit game or three-day turnover to an nit game he was suddenly going to play jalen washington 18 minutes and tyler nickel 15 minutes and 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 do enough to keep them here in chapel hill I, i i don't think there's there's no basis for that argument because there is nothing that we have seen previously that would give any credence that that would happen. It would have been more of the same. 
I completely agree. And even if you do, let's say in the in this alternate reality where he replaced it, it, the Carolina gives the NIT and he replays the bench. I mean, is that really a good look either? Like, hey guys, regular season's over. We're not playing for anything anymore. Now you guys can go play basketball. Like, I don't I don't know if that's even a good look either. But again, it, I don't think it ever would have happened. And again, we'll never know because Carolina didn't yeah. turn down the NIT. But I think it's there's just like you said, no evidence based on what we've seen over the last two years to think that ever would have happened. Um. Let's move on to Monday, AJ, which is yesterday, obviously. Um, big news coming out of that. Tyler Nickel, Justin McCoy announced there into the transfer portal. Tyler Nickel, probably a little bit more surprising than McCoy. McCoy, obviously, a senior, has one year left because of COVID, went through all the senior day festivities. So he was leaving regardless, for lack of a better word. But obviously, Nickel came in as a freshman, leading scorer in Virginia high school. History absolutely lit it up during um, no, I forgot late night, whatever they call it now. I can't even remember. It's been so long since we had that, um, had a massive game and then had some chances this year, but ultimately kind of similar to what we've seen over the last couple of years with Hubert playing his bench, just didn't get a lot of opportunities. We'll do another podcast about that at a later time. So stay tuned for that one. Um, and then I'll, I'll throw Caleb love in there as well. Cause as some people might've seen on, on social media, Instagram in particular, basically took off every photo of him related to North Carolina, changed his profile picture everything like that. So an interesting day yesterday as well um, with the guys transferring in. I, I, I tweeted it out. We've talked behind the scenes, AJ. I don't think those will be the only two guys that leave either. No, well, the three of them had their meetings. Hubert started his postseason, uh, end of season exit interviews or meetings with the players on Saturday or Sunday. Mm-hmm. I think it was probably Sunday. And, um, you know, we know that McCoy was, or excuse me, that Styles was in there. Dontre Styles was in there Sunday night. So he already had it with Caleb. He's had it with Nickel. He's had it with McCoy. He's had it with Styles and a couple of others. And um, as far as uh, McCoy goes, I wasn't really sure what he was going to do. It depended if he wanted to play another year. He, he, he works on his game a ton. He's actually mm-hmm. got a really nice game. Mm-hmm. He just doesn't have that extra balance that you need to be consistently successful in the ACC. I think he can go to another level for a year and have a really nice year and can really help another another program and get into grad school somewhere. As far as nickel goes, that was not on my radar. I mean, I admit 100%. I, I did not have that on my radar at all. But now, as I start, I'm starting to learn about some of the reasons behind it, and I don't want to go into everything here uh, in this podcast. We do have it on our site, though. And you can access it for just eight thousand thirty three cents a month. month. <laughs> Check us out. Um, Link below. Because I, I don't – yeah, I – I just don't want to put some of the things out here in a free airwave like that. I don't think that's fair, but um, now that I'm starting to learn more about it, it kind of makes a little bit of sense. Uh, He, I think that Hubert messed up and not playing him more. He played quite a bit in some early games and I don't buy into the thing where Tyler Nichols stinks defensively. I think he's better than people say. I think he's a victim of some stereotypes about just looking at him as a player and that he's not super bouncy. So therefore he's not a really good defensive player. I thought he thought he was improving. I talked to Hubert after the Virginia tech game about Tyler's improvement defensively. And Hubert said, yeah, he's really getting better off the ball. And Tyler told me that same day that he had made a point of emphasis at getting better off the ball because it takes longer to get better on the ball, but you're playing off the ball defensively a lot more in a game than you're playing on the ball. Your guy's only going to have the ball for X amount of time. So most of the time you're playing off it. So that was a point of emphasis for him. Thought he had done pretty well with that. Uh, he He's a guy that should be able to shoot, didn't shoot that well this season. But I also think that if you go back and look at Tyler Nickel through Christmas, he was an aggressive player when he got the ball. He he, he would, would drive. He would – he would run the baseline. He would do a lot. We, we thought, man, he could, might be a really good baseline player because yeah. he's pretty strong too, right? Then watch him the last six, seven weeks of the season. A lot of the guys on the bench, and again, we'll go into the bench, but we're going to do a bench podcast tomorrow or, or, or the day after. But I, I thought that his aggressiveness, his assertiveness diminished. I think his confidence was hurt. Oh, yeah. He should have played more. He helped him in the comeback at Virginia Tech. He helped him in some other games. He had 16 against the Citadel. So he yes. showed that he could be explosive. Uh, some of the guys used to talk about T. Nick, man, like he could light it up. But mm-hmm. he got into games and increasingly looked uncomfortable, looked less comfortable, and didn't get the ball a lot, which is kind of quite crazy. If he's such a great shooter, didn't get the ball a lot. And I think there was a need to get more scoring on the floor, and I think that's part of the issue with the family, is that, look, you got guys out there shooting 20%. Mm-hmm. And you got the leading score in Virginia high school history over here. Why the hell ain't he on the floor? 
at yeah, least, at least go, try. How can he do any worse than what they're doing out there? Mm-hmm. And I understand that. It goes back to what I said about lack of adjustments. An adjustment sometimes is just saying, hey, you, go on in there. Get that guy a break. See what you can do. Because mm-hmm. we've got to try something. Mm-hmm. You know, and baseball managers switch around batting order sometimes just to shake things up. Sometimes it works. And sometimes a coach needs to do that in basketball. Hubert just didn't do it. The only time he 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 gave some of these guys extended opportunities was while Nance was out. And that was pretty much it. So I think Nickel was a victim of that. I think he should have been on the floor more. Uh, he's not, he wasn't, and he's gone. So, um, too late now. Yeah. I think, I think that's a loss. I don't, I, I do like too. Justin. I Justin's a nice kid. I like his game, but I think he's really going to enjoy a year of college basketball somewhere else getting a lot of minutes because he wouldn't have gotten any more playing time next year at North Carolina. No. So he made the right move for himself. And Tyler's going to go somewhere. You know, we're hearing, we're hearing some schools. You can go on our site and check it out. I do not want to put that out there in a free medium just yet. I don't think that's fair to Tyler, but we're hearing some schools where he would be a really good fit. Yeah. Oh, no doubt. And, I think, and, they're, I think and he, they're in They're in his home. One of them is in his home state. I think he will be. I really do think he has the ability to be an elite scorer at, at, a, at a pretty high level. Cause I, I do think he has that to his game. Again, I know a lot of people say, well, he just played against nobodies in high school. You don't become the leading scorer in Virginia high school history and get recruited by North Carolina. If you're not a pretty dang good basketball player. So I think that's, <laughs> That there's a little there's a lot Everybody of revisionism else with him. him. There's a lot of revisionism yeah, he, with him going on too, because it's like, well, you know, you know, he was he wasn't a highly rated kid. He was like 90th rated kid in the class. You know, wasn't good enough anyway. And I'm like, I just think that's ridiculous. He never got the opportunity. I think an equal opportunity, and yeah. you could tell his confidence was drained, just like a majority of the bench's confidence was drained. I think I think just, Ralph. I know I'm going. I'm not going way back in time here, but I think Ralph Sampson played in the same high school district. So yeah. You know, so whatever. I mean, if you could play, you could play. Doesn't matter where you come. From. Yeah, again, if you, you score play. that many points, I don't care who you're playing against here. Yeah, as far as Caleb goes, Jacob. Yeah, as far as Caleb ask you goes, about Caleb, yeah, yeah. I I know I may piss some people off here, but I think it's absolutely disgusting the way people have treated him. Absolutely disgusting. I do too. He's and he's been grown, the scapegoat for, for grown life. men <clears throat> to have driven this kid to remove a lot of his stuff and go go silent on social media i i think these people need to reevaluate some things because he's not a bad kid he's not a bad kid at all no. he doesn't try to miss shots because he didn't play as well as people wanted him to play or thought he should have played they're going to bash him and, and maybe i have the the advantage of having gotten to know him a little bit being around him after good games and bad games and, and i get the body language thing, because it's a criticism everybody in the media has as well. I totally get the horrible shot thing because I've written about it many, many times and I've tweeted about it and we've talked about it in podcasts and everything. He's aware of that stuff too. He Mm. knows it. I'll talk to him after a game and actually he had a really good game. It was against BC just the other night. And I said, you know, and I wrote a little thing in our takeaways about the whole of Caleb's game was there. Some of the bad things, a lot of the good things because the drive to the rim, the floater and the runner, the three, the, the taking people off the dribble and leaving their jocks in the roof and the ceiling. That was all part of his game that night. And I asked him about the whole of his game and he immediately went to the turnovers in the second half. He knows he's mm-hmm. well aware. And, you know, he's got some bad isms in his game that he's desperately tried to fix that he has struggled to fix. And sometimes he would get down on himself and a bad play would carry for a sequence of events and it would lead to more bad plays. His turnovers usually came in bunches. Mm. They usually came in bunches. And I think you saw it in BC at four in the second half of that game. He was almost pristine in the first half. He had four turnovers in the second half, but that's what he went to when I asked him about the whole of his game. So he's aware of it, but I just think it's disgusting that I people too, would yeah. go after him to that point. You know, if you, if you embrace the shot over Mark Williams and you embrace the run last year, and you're going to turn around and dog the kid to the extent that people have, then, you know, give back the shot, give back the run. Don't embrace it anymore because he's not why the team struggled this year. They are all why the team struggled this year from Hubert Davis, right on down. No, it, it, was a program, it was a, it was a program failure. Mm, it wasn't a, a Caleb love failure. Caleb played his part. No doubt about it, but it wasn't his fault. It, it wasn't Pete Nance's fault. We kept telling people he wasn't Brady Manic. A lot of folks wouldn't listen. They expect him to be Manic. He just didn't fit the way maybe Hubert thought he would fit. He was a five. He played with Hubert played with two fives out there. People should stop bashing Pete. 
But Caleb, give me a break, man. Three years, he gave you guys a magical run that can never take away. You can never take away what they did to Coach K. Mm-hmm. And Caleb is as big a reason why that happened as anybody. Maybe the biggest reason that that happened. So lay off the kid. Leave him mm-hmm. be. And if he leaves and goes to another school for a year, and there are other schools that will take him in a heartbeat and probably fork over some NIL cash too. Or if he chooses to go the professional route, maybe go G League and try to get a two-way contract, leave him be. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people have, you said it before we came on the air, run him out of town. I, I agree that's part of it. Kid, mm-hmm. The kids shouldn't have to turn off his social media because a bunch of people are acting like idiots and and going after him the way they are. So if you're one man. of those people and you don't like what I said, oh, well, yeah, won't be the no, first time. We'll get to wrap this up in a second, but I'll stay on that for a second. I think it's ridiculous. And, uh, you know, it, it, there's no I don't care how how bad you think a player is playing or how much responsibility you think this guy has for the failures of this team, which, like you said, it it doesn't start with Caleb Love. It starts from the top down. Is everybody, yeah. everybody equally contributed to how bad this team was this year and how that much they underachieved and some uh, more than others. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> some more than others, no doubt about it. That's and another we'll, podcast. Yeah, I'm about to say we'll talk about more in depth on stuff like that. But I, and we, t- I don't know. I think we've talked about this before a little bit off camera. But the last thing I'll say on is too is I, I don't necessarily feel like he was helped by the staff at times too because one thing we've talked about all season is. There's times when Caleb Love just doesn't have it, it, it during games. I mean, I think we can all see that for the last three years, particularly this year. There was there was games this year where, you know, he's going to the halftime break one for nine, zero oh for seven. But it never felt like he was taken out or, you know, come sit with me, reset for a second. You know, it just felt like, all right, Caleb, you're, you're one for eight. Well, you're still playing 35 minutes tonight. And sometimes it's just not your night and it gets worse and worse and worse. And then people just all of a sudden they look at your stat sheet and you've scored four points and shot 20 percent and you're the reason they lost, not everybody else's, you know, collective effort of Carolina shooting 30% in the game. No, it's just Caleb. If he would have shot better, they would have won. So I I even feel like at times he wasn't helped by the people who probably should have been protecting him a little bit more. And it kind of, the snowball got bigger as the year went on and bigger. They should have reined him in. Yeah. They should have reined him in. It never felt like that happened. Yeah. Never felt like that. Yeah. Hubert should have reined him in more. And, um, Hubert talks about accountability a lot, but I didn't see it when it came to Caleb because he did have some destructive stretches. When he got bad for a while, he was bad for a while. Yeah. And and he knows it. I mean, Caleb knows these things. Yeah, he's he knows. uber aware of it. He's not he's uber aware of it. It's just, you know, there's a lot of people watching and listening to this thing right now that they don't want to eat that pizza, but damn it, they just, okay, this one last time, I'm going to eat the pizza. And then they do it again, or the ice cream, or the French fries, or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. People have weaknesses. Caleb has a weakness where he has a difficult time sometimes, you know, crossing that line where he doesn't let some of the bad stuff anchor him down. And Mm. and that's something he still needs to learn as a player. When he does learn that, then that special talent could be a special, could lead to a special player. We saw a special player at times. I think Wednesday night against Boston College, that was special. Mm -hmm. That crossover and that first step was special that night. That was pro, that was NBA stuff. The problem is there's a lot of the other junk and I just don't think people should bash him to the, to the degree that they have. You could be upset and frustrated and I get that. And I know there, there were times where he'd make a mistake. He'd, he'd jog up the court, belly aching at the refs. That's what I said about a mistake carries with him Sometimes that's part of his game that needs to mature to cut the cord to mistakes much quicker. And maybe he does that somewhere else next mm-hmm. year. Maybe he surprises people and comes back to North Carolina. Who the heck knows? It doesn't really matter because his game is only going to flourish when he learns to cut that off. Mm-hmm. And when he does, then he has a chance of becoming the player that a lot of people projected a few years ago. Yeah, and that we've seen in glimpses as well. Because like you said, he was he was spectacular during that run at times. And he's been spectacular for North Carolina at times, and not just during that run. So, yeah, yeah I agree. It, just cut it out with all the it, – it, it, and it doesn't do the kid any good. It doesn't do – it just makes you feel better for five seconds. I mean, it, it it's ridiculous. Just stop bashing him. It, it's, it's not warranted. And, again, it doesn't do anybody any favors or help anything out. So we'll move on from that and, and wrap this one up, AJ. Again, we'll have a lot of other podcasts coming out over the next week or so. We'll be doing – um, a few more. So stay tuned for that and make sure you keep it locked to tarillustrate.com. AJ mentioned earlier, you can sign up for just 833 a month. 
great time to do so. There's so much intel on the boards, especially our surrounding transfers, what's going on kind of behind the scenes. And obviously spring practice is underway as well. I know they're on spring break right now, but spring practice in full effect too. So keep it locked to tarlowstray.com links below 833 a month to sign up, become a premium member. You can become a Carolina insider too. I've been Jacob Turner. He's been Andrew Jones. Another episode of the THI podcast. We appreciate you watching. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.